discussing the fundamentals of fat loss, we delve into a realm beyond mere calorie counting, focusing on the pivotal role hormones play in this process. Recognizing the hormones responsible for fat burning, alongside those that facilitate fat storage, and understanding how to modulate their activity, is key to achieving success in weight management. The importance of hormone balance is often overlooked, even by specialists such as endocrinologists, who may prescribe treatments like testosterone for imbalances without addressing the crucial aspect of diet. In our discussion, we'll explore natural strategies to either enhance or suppress hormones that influence fat metabolism, with a spotlight on insulin, a crucial hormone produced by the pancreas that plays a central role in this dynamic. It does a lot of things, but one of the main things it does is it helps you store fat. In the absence of insulin, all of the effects of insulin causing storage of fat are reversed. So if we want to increase fat burning, we must lower insulin. You cannot burn fat if insulin is too high. You can be doing all these other things to increase all the fat burning hormones, but if this fat making hormone called insulin is elevated, it nullifies all of the other hormones that help you lose weight. This is why this information is very important because let's say, for example, you go to the gym or you're exercising, right? And then you have this pre-workout protein bar that's loaded with sugar. You basically nullified your ability to burn fat. Or let's say you're working out and you drink your Gatorade filled with glucose. You just nullified that workout. The other really interesting thing about insulin is all it takes is a little bit of carb to block a lot of weight loss for a period of time. So let's say for example, I don't know, every other day you drink a little bit of wine or maybe you have a piece of bread, just a little bit of carbohydrate, your ability to burn fat just went way down. Now it could take 24 hours or longer to burn fat. You can't just sort of do it a little bit. You have to just be all in and do it for a period of time to see the results. When we talk about what triggers insulin, we have carbohydrates, okay? What are carbohydrates? You have starches, you have fiber and sugars. Fiber is the only one that will not elevate insulin. So you don't have to worry about foods very, very high in fiber, like green vegetables, like salad. They have so much fiber, so little starch, that it's not going to elevate insulin hardly at all. But typically, you want to aim for less than 50 grams of carbs per day, not per meal, per day. But if you really want to speed it up, I would bring it down to like 20 or even less than 20 carbs per day. The other thing that elevates insulin is eating in general. It's better to eat less frequent. So this is called intermittent fasting. It's not just the carbs. It's not just the frequency of eating that causes the elevation of insulin. It is also the seed oils. They basically trigger insulin resistance. They create a lot of inflammation a cellular damage, and out of all the things that parallel the trend of obesity, it's the seed oils that parallel obesity the most, which is interesting. Be careful at restaurants. It's in salad dressing. The other thing that elevates insulin is MSG monosodium glutamate. There's a debate with monosodium glutamate. I mean, if you look this up, it'll say, oh yeah, no, it doesn't elevate insulin, it won't cause weight gain. Have you ever been to a fast food restaurant where they just load you up with MSG or even like a Chinese restaurant? What you're going to notice is that about an hour later, you are hungry. And it's a lot of hidden sodium, which is going to make you thirsty. And if we trick the brain into thinking it's getting some protein when it's really not, you know, within probably an hour and a half, you're going to like start craving something. The next hormone is estrogen. Estrogen can make you fat too. If you've ever heard about estrogen dominance, that's like a woman that has excess weight in the lower part of her body. And you can elevate estrogen by giving someone birth control pills, hormone replacement therapy, things like that. All right, the third hormone to talk about is cortisol, very important. I'm going to show you this book right here. This is called Encyclopedia of Medical Illustrations Endocrine System. Okay, let's take a look at this right here. You see this guy right here? See that belly? It's coming from the adrenals. 
So the adrenal glands are pumping out the stress hormone called cortisol, and it's pushing the fat in the midsection. Let's take a look at this one right here too. Boom. This is too much cortisol. You can see the belly, so the body is going to grab protein from the leg and the gluteus maximus, which is your butt muscle, and convert that into sugar and then fat right in the belly. When you go through stress or you take prednisone, which is a synthetic version of cortisol, you can gain a lot of weight, not just in your belly, but in your face too. Like they called it a moon face. So cortisol directs the fat more in the midsection, more than any other place around the gut as a survival mechanism. You also sometimes will get a buffalo hump in the back of your upper back. And this cortisol will also nullify the fat burning hormones, okay? Which I'm gonna talk about next, like testosterone. And also, and this is very important, insulin will nullify all of your fat burning hormones. How do we lower insulin? This is like the most important action. Number one, to lower insulin, you must lower your carbohydrate below 50 grams. I would lower it below 20 grams per day. I would do intermittent fasting, okay? Eat less frequently. I would also take apple cider vinegar in your water. I would consume berberine. It kind of mimics the medication metformin, which has to do with controlling insulin resistance, but without the side effects. Cinnamon is another really good herb as well. All right, and then estrogen. It's just about avoiding estrogen, avoiding things that mimic estrogen. That would be like certain chemicals in the environment, so you wanna do more organic. And then cortisol. How do we lower cortisol? Stress reduction, physical work around the house to get your attention off stress, go for long walks, take vitamin B1. All of those are very important. But there's one more, vitamin D. Vitamin D will help you lower cortisol. All right, let's switch over to the fat burning hormones. There are two main hormones that kind of work together. Growth hormone, which is also an anti-aging hormone, and another hormone called IGF number one, insulin-like growth factor number one. It's a similar function to growth hormone. Probably the best ultimate workout would be sprinting with growth hormone and IGF number one, intense exercise, good sleeping, moderate protein, and intermittent fasting. The next hormone is testosterone. Here's a hormone that a lot of men are taking, and you can increase it by making sure that you either consume foods high in zinc or make sure you're eating enough cholesterol. Cholesterol is the building block of testosterone and other hormones. So if you're on a statin or if you're on a low saturated fat diet, you could be starving off your testosterone. The next fat burning hormone, glucagon. Glucagon will be nullified when you increase insulin. Glucagon is triggered by a moderate amount of protein and intense exercise, very similar to growth hormone in IGF number one. All right, the next one is adrenaline. Adrenaline is increased with exercise. Adrenaline is also a neurotransmitter. And then you have the thyroid hormones, T3. That's the active form of the thyroid hormone. The way that you increase thyroid hormone is to remove the things that are blocking the thyroid hormone, like a fatty liver, like a problem with your kidney, like an iodine deficiency or a selenium deficiency or an estrogen dominant situation, because if you have too much estrogen, that can block your thyroid. But the thing you need to know about exercise is that exercise really only contributes to about 15% of your overall weight loss. However, it can really greatly lower your stress and help you sleep to really make this whole program work. So even though it contributes 15%, if you don't exercise, my viewpoint is it's going to take a lot longer to get where you need to go. Based on this information, you now know how to burn fat and you know the relative importance between the fat burning hormones and the fat making hormones, especially insulin and cortisol. Those are the dominating hormones that will nullify the rest. Now, since we're on the topic of weight loss, there's one more associated condition that's very important to get a full understanding on, and that is insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is a complex condition in which your body does not respond as it should to insulin, a hormone your pancreas makes that's essential for regulating blood sugar levels. 
Several genetic and lifestyle factors can contribute to insulin resistance. Insulin resistance, also known as impaired insulin sensitivity, happens when cells in your muscles, fat and liver, don't respond as they should to insulin, a hormone your pancreas makes that's essential for life and regulating blood glucose, sugar levels. Insulin resistance can be temporary or chronic and is treatable in some cases. Under normal circumstances, insulin functions in the following steps. Your body breaks down the food you eat into glucose, sugar, which is your body's main source of energy. Glucose enters your bloodstream, which signals your pancreas to release insulin. Insulin helps glucose in your blood enter your muscle, fat, and liver cells so they can use it for energy or store it for later use. When glucose enters your cells and the levels in your bloodstream decrease, it signals your pancreas to stop producing insulin. For several reasons, your muscle, fat, and liver cells can respond inappropriately to insulin, which means they can't efficiently take up glucose from your blood or store it. This is insulin resistance. As a result, your pancreas makes more insulin to try to overcome your increasing blood glucose levels. This is called hyperinsulinemia. As long as your pancreas can make enough insulin to overcome your cell's weak response to insulin, your blood sugar levels will stay in a healthy range. If your cells become too resistant to insulin, it leads to elevated blood glucose levels, hyperglycemia, which over time leads to prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. So what is the difference between insulin resistance and diabetes? Anyone can develop insulin resistance, temporarily or chronically. Over time, chronic insulin resistance can lead to prediabetes and then type 2 diabetes if it's not treated or able to be treated. Prediabetes happens when your blood glucose levels are higher than normal, but not high enough to be diagnosed as diabetes. Prediabetes usually occurs in people who already have some insulin resistance. Prediabetes can lead to type 2 diabetes, T2D, the most common type of diabetes. T2D happens when your pancreas doesn't make enough insulin or your body doesn't use insulin well, insulin resistance, resulting in high blood glucose levels. Type 1 diabetes, T1D, happens when your body's immune system attacks and destroys the insulin-producing cells in your pancreas for an unknown reason. T1D is an autoimmune and chronic disease, and people with T1D have to inject synthetic insulin to live and be healthy. While T1D is not caused by insulin resistance, people with T1D can experience levels of insulin resistance in which their cells don't respond well to the insulin they inject. Gestational diabetes is a temporary form of diabetes that can happen during pregnancy. It's caused by insulin resistance that's due to the hormones the placenta makes. Gestational diabetes goes away once you deliver your baby. Approximately 3% to 8% of all people who are pregnant, people in the United States are diagnosed with gestational diabetes. Who does insulin resistance affect? Insulin resistance can affect anyone you don't have to have diabetes, and it can be temporary. For example, using steroid medication for a brief period causes insulin resistance or chronic. The two main factors that seem to contribute to insulin resistance are excess body fat, especially around your belly, and a lack of physical activity. People who have prediabetes and type 2 diabetes usually have some level of insulin resistance. People with type 1 diabetes can also experience insulin resistance. Back to weight loss tips. Hundreds of fad diets, weight loss programs, and outright scams promise quick and easy weight loss. However, the foundation of successful weight loss remains a healthy calorie-controlled diet combined with increased physical activity. For successful, long-term weight loss, you must make permanent changes in your lifestyle and health habits. How do you make those permanent changes? Consider following these six strategies for weight loss success. One, make sure you're ready. Long-term weight loss takes time and effort and a long-term commitment. While you don't want to put off weight loss indefinitely, you should make sure you're ready to make permanent changes to eating and activity habits. Ask yourself the following questions to help you determine your readiness. Am I motivated to lose weight? 
Am I too distracted by other pressures? Do I use food as a means to cope with stress? Am I ready to learn or use other strategies to cope with stress? Do I need other support, either from friends or professionals, to manage stress? Am I willing to change eating habits? Am I willing to change activity habits? Do I have the time to spend on making these changes? Talk to your doctor if you need help addressing stressors or emotions that seem like obstacles to your readiness. When you're ready, you'll find it easier to set goals, stay committed, and change habits. Two, find your inner motivation. No one else can make you lose weight. You must undertake diet and exercise changes to please yourself. What's going to give you the burning drive to stick to your weight loss plan? Make a list of what's important to you to help you stay motivated and focused, whether it's an upcoming vacation or better overall health. Then find a way to make sure that you can call on your motivational factors during moments of temptation. You might want to post an encouraging note to yourself on the pantry door or refrigerator, for instance. While you have to take responsibility for your own behavior for successful weight loss, it helps to have support of the right kind. Pick people to support you who will encourage you in positive ways without shame, embarrassment, or sabotage. Ideally, find people who will listen to your concerns and feelings, spend time exercising with you or creating healthy menus, and share the priority you've placed on developing a healthier lifestyle. Your support group can also offer accountability, which can be a strong motivation for sticking to your weight loss goals. If you prefer to keep your weight loss plans private, be accountable to yourself by having regular weigh-ins, recording your diet and exercise progress in a journal, or tracking your progress using digital tools. Three, set realistic goals. It may seem obvious to set realistic weight loss goals, but do you really know what's realistic? Over the long term, it's smart to aim for losing one to two pounds, 0.5 to one kilogram a week. Generally, to lose one to two pounds a week, you need to burn 500 to 1,000 calories more than you consume each day through a lower calorie diet and regular physical activity. Depending on your weight, 5% of your current weight may be a realistic goal, at least for an initial goal. If you weigh 180 pounds, 82 kilograms, that's nine pounds, four kilograms. Even this level of weight loss can help lower your risk of chronic health problems, such as heart disease and type two diabetes. When you're setting goals, think about both process and outcome goals. Walk every day for 30 minutes is an example of a process goal. Los 10 pounds is an example of an outcome goal. It isn't essential that you have an outcome goal, but you should set process goals because changing your habits is a key to weight loss. More four, enjoy healthier foods. Adopting a new eating style that promotes weight loss must include lowering your total calorie intake, but decreasing calories need not mean giving up taste, satisfaction, or even ease of meal preparation. One way you can lower your calorie intake is by eating more plant-based foods, fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. Strive for variety to help you achieve your goals without giving up taste or nutrition. Get your weight loss started with these tips. Eat at least four servings of vegetables and three servings of fruits daily. Replace refined grains with whole grains. Use modest amounts of healthy fats, such as olive oil, vegetable oils, avocados, nuts, nut butters, and nut oils. Cut back on sugar as much as possible, except the natural sugar in fruit. Choose low-fat dairy products and lean meat and poultry in limited amounts. Five, get active, stay active. While you can lose weight without exercise, regular physical activity plus calorie restriction can help give you the weight loss edge. Exercise can help burn off the excess calories you can't cut through diet alone. Exercise also offers numerous health benefits, including boosting your mood, strengthening your cardiovascular system, and reducing your blood pressure. Exercise can also help in maintaining weight loss. Studies show that people who maintain their weight loss over the long term get regular physical activity. How many calories you burn depends on the frequency, duration, and intensity of your activities. 
One of the best ways to lose body fat is through steady aerobic exercise, such as brisk walking for at least 30 minutes most days of the week. Some people may require more physical activity than this to lose weight and maintain that weight loss. Any extra movement helps burn calories. Think about ways you can increase your physical activity throughout the day if you can't fit in formal exercise on a given day. For example, make several trips up and down stairs instead of using the elevator or park at the far end of the lot when shopping. Six, change your perspective. Adopting a healthy diet and engaging in regular exercise are not practices to be temporarily observed for a few weeks or months, but are fundamental changes to be integrated into your daily life for enduring weight management success. Initiating these lifestyle adjustments requires a truthful examination of your eating habits and daily activities. Identify the personal obstacles that hinder your weight loss journey and devise a plan to gradually alter the behaviors and mindsets that have undermined your previous attempts it's crucial to not only acknowledge these challenges, but to also prepare for how you will overcome them to achieve a lasting weight loss. Encountering setbacks is a part of the process. Rather than letting a setback lead to abandonment of your goals, reset and begin anew the following day. Embrace the mindset that you are on a journey to transform your life, a process that unfolds gradually. Commitment to a healthy lifestyle will pay off in the long run.